The actions of the story will take place in the novel Empress Rosaline. Its protagonist has an attractive appearance, a kind soul and a sincere nature. This is a classic love story with three elegant male characters, one of whom is the Emperor's cousin, Marquis Rainier von Werner, a handsome guy with golden hair and blue eyes. The youngest and strongest knight of the Empire is Lord Maynard von Arns. Looks like a simple, kind guy with brown hair and green eyes. And the third hero, the Lord of the Continent, the God of Battles, the Sun Emperor, Adel Ivern. In addition to his accomplishments, he was also memorable for his appearance, with hair dark as night and eyes as blue as the ocean. The story of the novel, which features such perfect male protagonists, begins with the mistake of one clumsy priestess. How could one make such a mistake at a purification ceremony? It must be performed in silence and under strict supervision. This ceremony was performed to secure the crops and ensure a good harvest and it was performed in complete silence. The mistake of the clumsy priestess at once made itself felt and a drought fell upon the empire. It was then that the lower class of nobles were relegated to commoners, considering that without their little money they were no different from the commoners. So Rosaline, who found herself in the same situation, went to the capital to earn money. With the help of a distant relative, the Countess Blumberg, she became the teacher of the Emperor's only brother, the Duke of Levy. In the Imperial Palace, she was loved not only by the Emperor, but also by two minor characters. The plot of this book tells how Rosaline, after going through all the hardships, becomes Empress. But what about the priestess who spoiled the ceremony? What became of her? But no one cared about her fate because she was only a minor character. Our story begins with a girl that abruptly wakes up all sweaty from a dream. She doesn't realize where she is. Her last memory is of getting a cat off the roof. She thought she might be in some kind of hospital, but she felt fine. Abruptly, a girl bursts into the room without knocking, and she had a tray of food with her. The girl immediately opened the door, began to resent and address the girl by name, Alina. She made such a mistake, and then pretended to be sick, as if she was not ashamed. The girl continued her indignation, shoving food at Alina, telling her to eat while she had the chance. The girl with white hair wasn't listening. All thoughts were occupied with her appearance. Alina was surprised that a foreigner speaks Japanese so well. The girl sadly put the tray on the pedestal and continued to say that the more she thought about what had happened, the more she realized that it was all her fault. She then looked angrily at Alina, not understanding how she could do such a thing, towards the temple that had picked her up off the street. Alina didn't understand what she was even talking about, or what temple she was talking about. She addressed her as a nurse and asked her if she was sure she had entered the right room. The girl tisked irritably and turned away, thinking that Alina had lost her mind. The girl was angry that she couldn't even leave Alina, even though she had ruined the ceremony. From tomorrow, she had to beg God for forgiveness. Having said that, the girl went to the door, slammed it and left. Alina didn't understand why she was treated this way, and what had even happened. She started calling for a nurse to sort it all out. Alina thought it was all a dream and the kitten she was running after and what was going on around her. She hoped that when she woke up, things would definitely go back to normal. Alina closed her eyes and tried to wake up, but nothing worked. Suddenly someone started calling the girl's name. In front of Alina this time was a red-haired foreign girl. She said in a trembling voice that her name was wrong and maybe she just looked like the same Alina. The girl with red hair was shocked by the girl's behavior. The girl asked in surprise if she remembered anything. Alina shook her head negatively and asked what the girl she didn't know was called. She introduced herself by the name Marie and asked if Alina knew why they wanted to kick her out of the temple. Marie brought Alina a mirror, hoping that by looking at herself she would be able to remember something. Looking at herself, the girl could not believe her eyes. She did not recognize this white hair, brown eyes and appearance as a foreigner. Marie asked why she had been acting so strange since the day of the ceremony. Helena grabbed the girl by the shoulders and started shaking her and asking her what she was talking about. Marie was scared. She was hurt. She didn't expect such a reaction. She started to calm Alina down and tell her what happened, that she had spilled wine at the purification ceremony, depriving all the villagers of their harvest. The girl started going over all the information in her head. The purification ceremony, the wine, she ruined everything. Comparing these facts and the appearance of the heroine, she remembered the novel Empress Rosaline. But she was not the protagonist or the rich woman. She was only a secondary clumsy priestess created for the ceremony. Realizing this she fainted, much to Marie's surprise. A year passes, the girl works in the castle as a cleaner. All tired from work she once again catches herself thinking that she should not indiscriminately read novels, especially loved ones, because she did not remember the contents of the novel at all. 
Within a year, Alina had gotten used to living in a new world and to her new name. Life after her heroine messed up wasn't much fun, because everyone treated her in a horrible way. Even the girls that worked with her were always making fun of her, talking behind her back and making fun of her every chance they got. It was like that today, they called out to Alina and threw a pile of dirty clothes in her direction. Because of the surprise and the pile of heavy dirty clothes, she fell down. The girl who did it, grinning, apologized and said that she had miscalculated her strength and asked to wash the clothes. The girls laughed, one of them wondered if they had overdone it, but the other girl continued to giggle and said it was alright, she was just a commoner. Alina was a middle-class priestess, but she had been expelled and what had happened a year ago was a good reason to mock her, of all people. Because of the piled-up household chores and being treated like that, she hated being Helena. Because of her lowered status and her clumsiness on the day of the ceremony, Helena had every possible difficulty. The servants of the Church of Rahan, the upper middle class priests under the Pope, were considered nobles. Helena did not understand how her heroine, an orphan from commoners, could become a middle class priestess. Suddenly, a man and a boy in sacred vestments went to Helena. Helena wanted to stand up, but the man stopped her. Pointing at the guy, he said her power was needed. The guy took off his shoe and brought his foot to the girl's face. Alina touched his foot with her wet hands and he immediately flinched. She saw the bump, lightly rubbed it, and the man at her side hurried her to get started. The boy, watching all this, did not understand why they needed the help of a low-ranking priestess. The boy didn't understand how a commoner could touch a nobleman's body, but he didn't resist because it was his teacher's order. Alina closed her eyes and concentrated. Healing is beyond the control of commoners, all thanks to divine power. With these thoughts, the bump on the guy's leg disappeared. Feeling relieved, the guy began to spin on one leg, happy to be healed. Alina asked the guy to be more careful and not to move so much, but he didn't listen to her and a second later he twisted his leg again. The man went from joy to irritation and anger. He began to blame Helena, saying that he expected nothing else from the strength of a sinner and that she should be grateful because he could not take away her blessing. Helena was angry at the man. Since he hated her so much he would have examined his disciple himself. Why did he have to go to her and make a fool of her? She didn't understand it. The girl bowed her head, apologized and bowed out. A little away from the priest she started to run away. On the way she tripped over a bucket and stopped. She was angry with herself and didn't realize how much longer this was all going to go on. Helena was determined to change her current life. But she had no family or friends and if she left, she would have nowhere to live. All Alina had was the pendant she had been wearing since the beginning. It would have made a good amount of money from it by selling it. But Alina couldn't do that. She didn't know anything about it, but she sensed that it was very precious to the former owner of the body. Helena sighed, chasing those away, no time to dwell in the clouds. She had a cleaning job waiting for her. She was about to leave as voices came from a room that no one usually used. Out of interest, the girl went to the voices. There were two men in the room. One of them was resenting the news he had learned from the man who was in the same room with him. He mentioned his majesty. It was about some new decree, which did not please the men very much. Holding her breath, Alina wanted to hear what the second man was saying. He was supporting his acquaintance's outrage. The man thought it was unacceptable that his majesty had found a new teacher for the quirky Duke Levy without their knowledge. Alina vaguely remembered the contents of the novel. Remembering something about Duke Levy, she recalled that his teacher in the novel was exactly Rosaline. Alina had an interesting idea. Rosaline became Duke Levy's teacher a year after the incident, that is, now. She continued to stand outside the door and heard something else interesting. Priest Genevieve retired. He was offered a large sum of money for it, but he refused. Hearing this, she remembered that in the story, priests were soon fired. Alina took off her apron and walked resolutely into the room with the men. She wanted to be a teacher. One of the men jumped up and asked who she was. Alina first apologized for barging into the room and interrupting their conversation. Then she introduced herself as Helena, a lower-class priestess. She was sure that if she entered the imperial palace, all this suffering would be over. The maid takes Helena to a room, telling her that this room was set aside especially for her and now she will live here. When they enter the room, Alina looks around the room in amazement. She noted that in terms of luxury, the imperial palace was on an unattainable level. The rooms in the temple were no comparison. Alina was jubilant at the luxury of such rooms. She could not believe that she had been able to enter the imperial palace. Alina remembered abruptly that all her things were left downstairs. The maid took it as an order and said that she would bring them right away. Alina relaxed and said she would do it herself, which surprised the maid. 
She asked if there was anything she was not allowed to touch. Helena, surprised, replied that there was nothing there. She just didn't want the maid to run back and forth. The maid looked at Alina with incomprehension and said that it was her job. Alina blushed at the awkward situation she had created. She had never been treated like this before. The maid simply melted because of the girl's reaction. She complimented her by saying that the followers of Mr. Rahan's teachings were on a whole other level. She was touched that Alina was thus concerned about a commoner maid like her. Alina, knowing the life of constant humiliation in this affair, couldn't have done otherwise. The maid quickly said that she would bring everything in a flash, and Alina should rest and ran out of the room. Alina wanted to stop the girl, but it was too late. She ran out of the room without listening to anything. Alina resigned and insisted on getting used to this attitude to herself. The girl began to look around the balcony. The air in the palace seemed completely different to her. Alina was determined to survive in the palace, no matter what, never to return to her past life. Let's go back a month to find out more about what happened in the room. After she introduced herself, one of the men looked at her strangely and said he was seeing her for the first time. Alina was shocked that they didn't recognize her, because they had blamed her in the past for that mistake at the ceremony. The girl stood waiting for an answer while the men argued, because they hoped they had found a secluded place and no one would hear them. Alina was not going to hide anything from them and directly reminded them of what had happened a year ago, that she was the one who spilled the wine on the day of the ceremony, and for that she was demoted to a lower-class priestess. One of the men gasped in surprise and remembered that although she was a commoner, her healing abilities had made her a middle-class priestess. Alina confirmed the man's words by calling him Cardinal Yabbit. The second man went closer to Alina and asked about the documents. If she was a middle-class priestess, then her papers were good and she would have no problem getting into the imperial palace. The man in front of Alina, among the cardinals is the highest nobleman and number two in the Rahan church, and his name is Cardinal Jeffrey. He looked at Helena thoughtfully and said that Duke Levy will not give up the girl, and at the same time she will have to atone for her sins. That's how Alina got to the Imperial Palace. Talking to Jeffrey and Javit was the easiest part of getting into the palace. Over the course of a month, she received a hell of a lot of etiquette lessons from Jeffrey. Alina was willing to do anything to no longer be treated like she had been. So she decided from now on, no more clinging to that place. While Alina was resting on the balcony, the maid had already returned with her things to her room. The maid decided to share the news that another teacher would arrive in the evening, Baron Francis' daughter. Alina blossomed with joy, because she would be able to see the main character live. But it was too early to relax. Alina had to make a lot of effort and use all her knowledge to stay in the palace. And the first thing she should think of is Duke Levy. He's the emperor's only brother and owner of the Palace of Dawn. He kicked out his teacher, the priest Genevieve, after a few days. Levy refused to take theology classes and interfered with the lessons. He was well described in the novel by the lines, Between heaven and earth, I alone am worthy of all things. None of the teachers stayed long, until, until Rosaline became his teacher. That's when he slowly began to open his heart. Later, however, an assassination attempt was made on him, then Duke Levy began to fear the swords. This became a big problem. Rosaline encouraged Levy to face his fear head on to overcome it. But the boy was not ready for that. One day she dragged him out into the street, where they encountered the emperor himself. Even his own brother made him fearful. Because of this, Rosaline and Duke Levy's relationship soured. At this time, Rosaline was able to mend her relationship with the Emperor while Levy's relationship with the Emperor was deteriorating. Helena was going to make a difference at least. She was not going to pressure the Duke. Even if all this happens as in the novel, Levy will be fine. After all, the main character, Rosaline and the actions of a minor character, should not affect the plot, so thought Alina. Alina walked around the grounds thinking about it and got lost, realizing that she was just walking wherever her eyes were and it would take her a long time to get back to her room. She got a little upset. She sat down to rest by a tree. Today she had important things to do, so she decided not to hurry and rest a little. But the rest did not last long. Behind her back there was a shout of a man who warned her to pay attention to everything. Alina jumped up, not realizing what was going on. Peeking out from behind a tree, she saw the servants greeting someone. From the way the servants were commotion, she guessed it was a man from the upper class. Looking at the person who was being greeted so solemnly, a badge with a familiar coat of arms caught her eye. Alina, surprised, assumed that this man was the emperor. Alina immediately wondered if he had come here to meet Rosaline or if the meeting would happen unexpectedly. The emperor is the main male character in the novel. 
In the story with Rosaline, he was kind and courteous, but, at the beginning of his reign, he was considered a true monster who conquered three states neighboring the Ipran Empire. Alina had the idea that he was a real war hero, but a terrible man, so it's probably for the best that she's not the main character. Alina saw off the silhouette of the Emperor going into the building, with thoughts that they wouldn't meet again. The reason for this was her place in the novel, so she didn't even think that anyone knew her name. In the Emperor's room, his aide was waiting for him. The Emperor asked if there was any news. The guy immediately began to tell the news. The first was that Marquis Werner had come to discuss some matters with the Emperor. Rainier was waiting for him in the parlor on the second floor. The butler asked the Emperor if he could prepare tea for them. But instead, the Emperor asked for alcohol to be prepared. From this request, the butler wilted before his eyes. The aide tried to persuade his majesty that they should not drink strong drinks immediately after dinner. But the emperor was adamant and said that nothing would happen to him from a couple of drinks. After these words, he went to the guest who was waiting for him. Rainier only heard the door opening and immediately turned around and joked, saying that he had waited so long for the emperor that he even wondered if he had lost his head. After that, he bowed and greeted his majesty properly. The emperor passed by Rainier and asked to get to the point. The marquis was upset at such a cold greeting from his cousin, especially after a long separation. After a brief scene, the marquis got down to business and told him that he had come to him to discuss about a gathering of aristocrats. The meetings were always very patriotic. Therefore, this time everyone was concerned about the personal life of the emperor. All the aristocrats were wondering when his majesty would find himself an empress. The emperor, realizing what was going to be discussed, began to chase the marquis away. But he did not retreat and continued to insist that it was time to think about it, convincing his majesty that getting married would solve many conflicts. One of the problems was forbidden love. Everyone was whispering that the marquis and the emperor were meeting secretly. The emperor nonchalantly changed the subject, because the marquis is also from the imperial family, so the issue of marriage is also relevant to him. The marquis, as if expecting this, had already prepared an answer. He tried to convince the emperor with words that he was only his majesty's cousin, and his love was too much to waste on one girl. The marquis, realizing that he could no longer influence anything, decided to change the subject, asking the emperor how his training with the captain of the knight squad went. Emperor unemotionally sipped from a glass of alcohol and replied that nothing interesting happened. Everything went as usual. The butler sadly watched the emperor. The war, which was aimed at strengthening the unstable position of the empire, lasted for three years. It ended five years ago, although they strengthened their position. But because of this, his majesty stopped caring at all. Butler also thought that the emperor needed someone to whom he could open his heart. The butler was distracted from his thoughts by the emperor. He called him by his name, Hugo, and asked if they had found a new teacher. Hugo the butler calmly replied that they had already sorted it out and began to tell him about the teachers. One of the teachers is Baron Francis' daughter who was recommended by Countess Bloomberg. She will be in charge of general education. And the second teacher who would teach theology was a priestess sent from the Temple of Rahan. The Marquis was glad that they had found new teachers so quickly. He thought because of Levy's notoriety, no one would want to teach him. Hugo asked if His Majesty would like to meet the new teachers. The Emperor looked thoughtfully out the window. He started to say something, but stopped because of a lot of thoughts. When Helena was being prepared for the palace, Geoffrey was very careful to teach the girl etiquette so that no one would think of her being a commoner, much less a middle-class priestess. Immediately after these words, he turned to Helena and made a remark as she set down her cup of tea, and made her repeat the whole thing again. Jeffrey's creepy voice made Alina wake up all sweaty. She immediately jumped up from such a nightmare. She was confused. So much effort and strength had been put in not to see it all over again in a nightmare after she got to the palace. Alina wanted to distract herself from her musings and looked out the window. At that time, a carriage arrived at the palace with a coat of arms with a lily on its shield. This coat of arms belonged to the Bloomberg family. Helena rushed outside to witness the scene of Rosaline's first appearance at the palace. When the carriage arrived at the palace at dawn, the protagonist stepped out of it and exclaimed in surprise. Rosaline marveled at the beautiful garden on the palace grounds. Helena ran downstairs and watched the protagonist and couldn't get enough of watching this scene and Rosaline's beautiful face live. 
Alina looked at Rosalind without taking her eyes off. Her smooth nose and round eyes, all as befitting a protagonist. She was incredibly beautiful. Rosaline looked at her and turned around, seeing a girl she didn't recognize, and asked who she was. Alina looked at her so much that she bowed a little clumsily and not hiding her admiration introduced herself, Alina, that she was a middle-class priestess who had come to the palace to teach Duke Lega theology. Rosaline gasped, she didn't expect to meet her colleague so quickly. The protagonist responded by introducing herself, Rosaline von Francis, in charge of Duke Levy's general education. Alina was simply delighted even with the voice, her heart completely won over by Rosaline. The protagonist asked where Alina was from, which was very puzzling to her, but she logically replied that she was from the temple. Rosalind continued to smile and said that she didn't mean it, but before she could finish she was distracted by the servants. All of Rosaline's things were removed from the carriage, so she could proceed to her room. Alina, from her sweet conversation with Rosaline, began to dream and fantasize about how she and Rosaline had become good friends. She was glad that she had left the temple, but Alina had to dream of a quiet, and happy life. Meeting Rosalind again, Alina was upset, because the bullying from which she fled from the temple began on the part of the protagonist. Rosalind noticed that Alina was just a commoner. Thirty minutes ago in the palace drawing room, Rosaline and Alina are talking over a cup of tea. Rosaline tastes the tea and praises its rich aroma and flavor, then wonders what Alina thinks. The girl continued to stare at the protagonist and did not hear her question right away. Rosaline turned to Alina once again and only after that, she answered that the tea is really delicious. Rosaline looked suspiciously at Alina's tea. She had been curious about something since their first meeting. Rosaline hadn't been able to ask the girl much last time, so now, she directly asked what family Alina was from. Alina turned pale. She didn't want to answer this inevitable question. Rosaline, having read the atmosphere, began to press the girl that she would finally be convinced of her conjectures. The protagonist convinced that there was nothing wrong with it. The two of them would be training the Duke. So it's okay to learn something about each other and bond. Alina's familiar pressure gave her goosebumps. Rosalind quickly changed her face and said she would start on her own to make Alina feel better. Smiling sweetly Rosalind began to say that she was from a baron's family located in the southwestern part of the empire. She is the eldest daughter in the family. Saint Helena's heart was pounding hard, but she pulled herself together and introduced herself as a middle-class priestess from the temple, adding that she was honored to meet Miss Francisco. Among priests, status plays a big role. So Alina hoped that her words would be enough for Rosaline to quench her interest. Rosaline, after thinking for a while, smiled and said that she was beginning to understand everything. Helena had a happy thought that it had worked out and they had gotten off the subject. Rosaline went on to talk about how she was worried at first about being alone in the palace. So the news of another teacher of her age pleased Rosaline. Only when she met Helena, she was disappointed, for the priestess was supposed to be from an honorable family. The coldness and contempt of those words made Alina shudder with fear. Rosaline from a nice girl turned into those people from whom Alina ran so much. The protagonist began to openly sling mud at her, calling her a commoner who had not even been taught etiquette before being brought to the palace. Alina was upset and trembling. The hostility and animosity towards her was very well felt. The trembling caused her to drop the teacup and it shattered to pieces on the floor. Rosaline was infuriated by this and began to resent that it was all an outrage and since she was a commoner she should clean up and collect all the shards herself. Rosaline had doubts about her thoughts, but Helena's etiquette gave her away. Alina was shocked. She didn't expect the kind and sweet protagonist to treat her like that. She did not understand why it was not mentioned in the novel. But remembering the plot, the story was told on behalf of the main character. It didn't say anything about commoners, but Francis's family only paid lip service to the circle of aristocrats. Rosaline's family could not even pay the tax for their lands. Perhaps that was why she hated the commoners. Rosaline, convinced that Alina was a commoner, opposed her teaching the duke. The girl looked at the determination of the protagonist and imagined what would happen to her if everyone found out who she was. Alina rushed to beg Rosaline to keep quiet about it. But she brushed her off, saying that her behavior was an abomination. Alina, once again, clung tightly to Rosalind and begged her to keep quiet. She was willing to do anything. Looking at Alina, Rosalind thought for a moment. She saw the desperation in her eyes and decided to take pity on her. Pulling her sleeve from Alina's hands, the protagonist stepped away from her and said that since she was so desperate to do anything, she would turn a blind eye. This is where their relationship as superior and subordinate begins. In saying this to Helena, Rosaline clearly felt superior to both her and pleased that she had gotten herself a pet. 
In order to hide Alina's origin, the protagonist needed to communicate with her as an equal and this greatly annoyed Rosaline. Alina immediately realized that now she would be in herself offered to help with cleaning and everything else. Rosaline leaned over to the girl and smilingly complimented her on her ability to grasp her position so quickly. She added that she should remember to do her laundry and sewing. Helena bowed her head and agreed, and Rosaline was pleased with her submissive behavior. A maid entered the room to announce that the Duke had arrived. Rosaline whispered for Helena to stop sitting on the floor like a hunchback and stand up at last. Helena was shocked. Such a quick change in Rosaline. You couldn't tell from her that she had been so arrogant recently. Helena's eyes were open to Rosaline's true personality. Now Helena would have to serve her. She didn't understand if it was normal that a person with such a character would find happiness at the end of the novel. Alina wondered if the characters in the book knew her true character. Was it related to their strained relationship with Duke Levy? Suddenly Alina was distracted from these thoughts by a child's voice, which was indignant that the girl did not listen to him and did not follow his orders. Alina lowered her eyes and in front of her stood a blonde-haired, cute boy who resented her. All his words she let pass her ears. Alina wondered if this cute boy was Duke Levy, the same boy that only bad things were said about. Duke Levy looked at Alina and resented her for not listening to him. Levy told the maid to remove the shards of the cup and Helena to move away so as not to disturb him. But she did not hear him and continued to stand still. When she was done dangling in the clouds, she stepped away from the shards to stay out of the way. Levy called her stupid and rebuked Helena, asking her what she would do if she hurt herself. After a couple of words, Alina realized that he was not so nice and would not go for a word in his pocket. The duke let the maid go when she finished cleaning and sat down on the couch. Noticing that Helena was still standing there, he asked her how long she was going to stand there. Helena shuddered and sat down on the couch next to Rosaline. The protagonist had long ago taken on the image of a proper lady. Duke Levy leaned back on the back of the sofa and started a conversation, asking the girls if they had come to train him. When he heard an affirmative answer, he looked at the desserts the maid had prepared and looked away from the table. Levy took a fork and began to twirl it in his hand, as if hesitating whether he should take a dessert. Helena saw the duke wanting to take a bite of strawberry cake. She was amused that he wanted to appear mature, even though he was a child. Just as Levy decided to reach for the dessert, Rosaline began to speak to him. Rosaline offered to discuss a lesson plan. She had heard that his previous teacher had taught him math, history, and theology. Rosaline began to praise Levy for his hunger for knowledge, telling him how much she admired him. Rosaline wanted to spend more time with the Duke, so she prepared in advance and offered to test Levy's knowledge so that she would know where to begin her studies. Duke Levy replied sharply and coldly that it was not necessary. He told her directly that she should do such things on her own. The past teachers should have left a class diary and with the help of it Rosaline was to find out everything herself. Alina was a little surprised and pleased that Levy had laid siege to the protagonist so immediately. The annoyed Duke asked Alina if she wanted to test his knowledge too. Alina calmly replied that before starting to discuss something it was better to eat something sweet before the tea got cold. She explained her suggestion by saying that one should not postpone eating food that contains the blessing of Mr. Rahan. Taking a bite of the strawberry cake Alina was holding out, he said that wasn't a bad idea. Calming down, Levy wondered how Alina was going to train him. Alina bluntly answered the Duke that she had no clear plan. Theology is based on understanding the teachings of the great Rahana. So instead of memorizing it, Alina suggested reading and discussing the holy writings. Levy didn't take long to agree to Alina's suggestion, much to Rosaline's dismay and surprise. Alina was glad that the duke did not reject her proposal, but the protagonist could not sit back and watch the small victory of her new subordinate. A short time later, Rosaline instructed Alina to bring from the library all the books from the large list that she had compiled. The girl was surprised to see such a large number of books, but Rosaline didn't care. It was her order that Alina had to fulfill and she cited her busyness in preparing for the class. Alina was uncomfortable and grew dark, lowering her head. Noticing the confusion in Helena's actions, Rosaline immediately began to press her with their agreement. Rosaline began to poke at Alina, reproaching her that she did not need to make a lesson plan, and therefore there was nothing to do. So she threateningly ordered her to hurry up and bring all the books on the list. Alina had nothing left to do and headed to the library. She hoped to find all the books quickly and be done with it. But the library turned out to be bigger than the outside. Alina just put her hands down with thoughts that she would grow old faster than finding all the books on the list. A library worker came into view. 
The girl approached and asked for help. The worker smiled sweetly, sympathized with Alina and said he would write down where she could find each of the books. Alina thanked the guy and stepped aside to wait. She remembered that in the novel, Rosaline had met one of the main male characters, but she couldn't remember who it was. The employee had already written everything down and gave the list to the girl, but sadly added that all the carts were now busy so she would have to carry all the books herself. Alina took a deep breath. She wasn't surprised because it couldn't be that simple. She gathered her strength because she had to carry them to the carriage and she was half done. Alina started running around the library looking for books on history, math. One of the books was very high on the shelves. She started to reach for it, but could not reach it. A male voice came from behind and asked if she needed help. Alina happily agreed and started to turn around to thank the man in his eyes. Turning around, Alina saw a young guy with brown hair, green eyes and wearing a uniform with a knight's badge with the emblem of the empire. Alina knew the main characters of the novel and at this time in the library, there could only be one knight. Alina did not keep her balance and started to fall, but the knight managed to pick her up by the waist and hugged her a little so that she did not hit the shelves behind her back. As she looked at him closer, Alina realized that this guy was Lord Maynard Von Arns. Alina blushed with embarrassment and by habit wanted to address the guy by name but in time changed her address to Lord Arns. She was embarrassed by the hand that continued to hold the girl tightly by the waist. Lord Arns from the awkward situation quickly removed his hand, blushed and began to apologize and justify himself. Alina reassured him, for nothing terrible had happened. A little while later, the Lord wondered how the girl knew his name, because he clearly heard how in the beginning Alina addressed him Maynard. Alina became frightened and started to get nervous. The justification was the rumors and the popularity of the Lord, thanks to which she recognized him. From such pleasant words, Lord Arns softened considerably. He was pleased to hear of his popularity. Arns crouched down to pick up a book and mysteriously began to confess to Alina that he had been watching her. The girl's heart fluttered. She wondered why a man like him was watching her. Alina, very sharp and cute running around the library, which attracted the gaze of Lord Arns. Such an answer upset the girl a little, she obviously expected a more romantic answer. Handing Alina the book he picked up he offered to help with the search for other books. The girl thanked him for his concern and softly said that she had already found all the books. All that remained was to carry them to the carriage, so Arns wanted to help with that at least. The Lord easily grabbed a huge amount of books and wanted to take the only book that Alina was holding. She sharply refused Arns, grabbing the book tightly. Alina wanted to carry at least something on her own. Blushing she started to run away from the library, asking the Lord not to follow her. Arns watched the girl and grinned. He managed to ask Alina how he could help carry the books if he wouldn't follow her. Lord Arns found Alina very amusing. The carriage on which Alina was supposed to return had somehow disappeared. So Arns helped the girl out a second time. Alina was very grateful to the Lord, but she could not understand how it happened that she was in the same carriage with one of the main characters. Alina was a little worried, for the plot, whether anything would happen because of their meeting in the ride. Maynard is the sword of the Empire, the great Lord of the South, Count Arns. As soon as his eldest son came of age, he was given orders in the middle of a war of conquest. He was to take on all swords and arrows directed against his majesty. Maynard carried out the order and returned alive. Though he looks like a kind and gentle man, his accomplishments speak of his strength and fortitude. Alina was pondering and kept looking at Arns. Because of this he thought he had something on his face and it made the Lord start talking. Maynard inquired what the girl would do with so many books. Alina bluntly said that these books she did not take for herself, but for Duke Levy's classes. The Lord became animated on hearing of Levy, but Alina laughed to stop his admiration, for she would only be teaching theology. Lord Arns still expressed his admiration because she is still Levy's new teacher. When Maynard raised his hands in admiration, Alina noticed a cut on his finger. She asked the Lord where the cut had come from, and it was only after the girl had paid attention that Arns saw the wound. He suggested that it might have been left by the books when he carried them or pulled them from the top shelves. Alina was horrified that such beautiful hands had gotten hurt because of her. Alina asked for her hand, which surprised the Lord and he began to deny it, saying it was fine. A stern look from the girl made him obey and give her his hand. Alina took the Lord's hand, concentrated and healed the wound on Arn's hand. Opening her eyes Alina said she could only help with that. But that was enough to surprise Arns. He thought only eminence had healing powers. Alina explained that this was not the case and such a simple wound could be healed by her as well. Such an ability had a downside. Only after healing the wound Alina got a headache. The Lord immediately noticed how the girl felt bad and got worried. 
It was already dark outside. At such a late hour they had just returned from the library to the palace. Alina asked the lord to just take the books out of the carriage, and then the servants would help her. Alina thanked Arns once more for all his help, wished him to take goodbye and was about to leave. A little unsure, Arns called the girl's name and asked her to say her name. After all, they had forgotten to properly introduce themselves to each other, due to the fact that she already knew his name. Alina looked at Arns in surprise. The Lord had given the first reason that came to mind to convince the girl to tell him her name, in case he needed her healing skills again. She looked at Lord Arns with incomprehension and said her name. Maynard glowed upon hearing the girl's name and happily offered to meet again. Alina doubted they would meet again. After all, they did cross paths by chance, but Maynard is one of the main characters, and Alina is a secondary character. The next day came. Today was supposed to be the first lesson with the Duke and the Duke didn't come to Alina's lesson. She was upset because they could get her in trouble. The more Alina thought about it, the more it hurt her pride. Levy had a class with Rosalind two hours ago, and he decided to skip her theology class. Alina flamed with rage. It looked like he was more interested in the protagonist than her cake idea. Instead of Levy, Alina was visited by his nanny Elijah. She came with the message that the Duke had a bad headache, so he couldn't make it to class. Aline wasn't too surprised by this, she expected something like this. Alina smiled sweetly, expressed excitement for the Duke and asked if she could check on him. By the nanny's excitement, it was noticeable that few people had asked for such a thing before. Helene didn't press the nanny and asked her to tell her that their class was postponed to the next time. Elijah apologized to Alina for her time and wished her to be more careful on the way home. As she left the room, Alina wondered what would happen if Levy didn't show up tomorrow. But the thought of the money that would accrue even if she didn't do the lessons made her happy. The free money helped her to solve her attendance problem, and because of that she became very relaxed about Levy's absences. A few days later came their next class, in which the Duke was also absent. In this situation, Alina didn't feel so anxious anymore. She only felt sorry for Nanny Elijah. Remembering the plot of the novel, Alina could understand why Levy was skipping classes. The previous priests had used some Spartan methods in teaching the Duke. The nanny felt sorry for Alina because of the fact that she came and waited for the duke every day. Ilya hoped that her master would come to his senses and still come to Alina's class, but she was content to have a quiet time. Immediately after the meeting with Helen, the nurse went to Levy. She told him that the priestess was still coming to class, which surprised the duke. He didn't expect her to be so persistent. Ilya tried to gently ask the duke when he would attend Alina's class, but Levy sharply began to refuse. All the sacred scriptures were written in a language he did not understand. Duke has to ask questions to understand everything, except all his past teachers, just looked at Levy like a fool. He didn't understand what he could learn from those who didn't want to teach him. The nanny was worried because if the duke continued to skip class, he might be scolded by the emperor. Levy immediately grew gloomy and turned away from nanny. Levy gloomily said that the emperor doesn't have time for this so nothing will happen to him. Elijah crouched on the duke's bed and tried to convince her master that things were not as he thought. There were rumors in the palace because of the fact that Duke Levy never left the palace grounds because he was forbidden to do so. He could not meet the emperor on his own. All the servants in the palace whispered and pitied him. Levy was tired of hearing such things and shouted at the nanny to leave him alone and not to cross him. The duke wanted to send the nanny out of the room and ordered a cake to be brought. The nanny came out of the duke's room and found the maids gossiping about Helena. They pitied her because she came to class every day, and the duke did not. 212 with one sound, Elijah roused the maids and asked them to bring a cake for the duke. They immediately became excited and began to carry out the order. The nanny sighed sadly. It wasn't all the duke's fault. Levy had survived the death of his parents as a child, and then also the assassination attempt. Nanny wanted the duke to remember that his majesty was always thinking of him. The next day, early in the morning, guests came to Helena. At the door of her room stood a male priest and a maid. The girl had just awakened. She did not expect anyone so early, so she went out in her nighty. The priest in an orderly tone told Helena to dress quickly because his holiness was waiting for her. Helena did not expect the Holy Father to come to her. She immediately thought of the worst, of her dismissal. The Holy Father of the Church of Rehan, the only one in the entire continent. She preaches the main religion. Alina quickly gathered herself and was already sitting in the carriage pondering what such an important person needed from her. 
the thoughts were only bad, Alina assumed that the rumors about her difficulties with the duke had reached the temple. Immediately after moving to the palace, there were two terrible problems. First, about the origin of Alina immediately recognized Rosaline. Second, Duke Levy did not attend Helena's theology classes. The carriage pulled up to the imperial temple. The accompanying priest asked Helena to remember to be polite and respectful when meeting with the Holy Father. Alina obediently nodded her head, but her thoughts were only of one thing, if she had a chance to escape right now. It took Alina no time to realize how she found herself in the imperial temple. She was looking around and marveling at the beauty. Cardinal Jeffrey began to resent Alina for not showing proper respect in front of the Holy Father, but for being in the clouds. The cardinal's shouting frightened the girl, and she began to be convinced that the thoughts of her dismissal were true. The Holy Father waved his hand and asked Jeffrey not to be so strict. The Holy Father always said of this to Jeffrey that he should be less rude. The cardinal bowed and said he would take these words to heart. Helena was surprised. She had never seen Cardinal Jeffrey so obedient. Having finished reprimanding Jeffrey, the Holy Father turned to Helena. Smiling sweetly he invited the girl to come closer. It was the first time that Helena had seen the great prophet Rahan. In spite of his position, he seemed to Helena quite a kind man. But she still did not understand why she had been invited to the imperial temple. She did not have to wait long for an answer to this question. The Holy Father received information that Alina has healing magic and he was interested to know about it, having met her. Alina immediately said without hiding that her power was not that impressive. The Holy Father had recently hurt his hand while leafing through a book. Smiling he asked Alina to heal his small wound. Seeing the girl's doubt, the man asked how difficult it would be for her. Alina was very nervous. She was not sure if she could heal the Holy Father. She had healed a couple of wounds before, but she couldn't heal her own hands, which were calloused from hard work. Groaning and smiling through her strength, Alina apologized to the Holy Father and said that it would be too much for her. The man scratched his beard thoughtfully, noticing the wounds on the girl's hands. He asked to be shown them to him. Gently taking Alina's hands, the Holy Father asked her to look carefully and began to use healing magic. Within a second, the girl's hands were as good as new, as if they had never been injured by hard work. Alina looked at the Holy Father with incomprehension and asked why he wouldn't heal her wound himself. The man smirkingly replied that this was the teaching of the great Rahana. One cannot heal one's own wounds with holy power. The Holy Father wanted to convey the message that one cannot live without the help of others. Alina perked up. It wasn't about her strength, even if her healing magic wasn't as strong. But she could help others a little and that explained why she couldn't heal herself. The Holy Father, again, asked if she could heal his hand. Alina was encouraged by the man's words. So she took his hand and concentrated and put all her strength into healing the small wound. The Holy Father watched Alina and pondered. From the information, the girl's powers were recent, but he thought she was amazing. The man thanked Helena and added that the great Rahan had blessed her with great strength. Helena was a little embarrassed by the flattery and began to thank the Holy Father in return for explaining everything to her. If it had not been for this meeting, she would have blamed herself for a long time, because of her useless power. Unexpectedly to Helena, the Holy Father said that he was always at the Imperial Temple and would be glad if she would drop in on him occasionally. He also mentioned that they could train her powers together. Alina thought that the reason for this kindness was her being in the palace. So, a little hesitantly, she told him that the duke was still not attending her theology class. Alina also shared that perhaps because of the duke's absences, she might be fired. The Holy Father laughed and advised that she should try to show the duke her pure intentions. Perhaps this would change his view of priests. The Holy Father's words for her not to be discouraged and to do her best gave her strength. For the first time since her rebirth, someone believed in her, encouraged her. Helena was overwhelmed with feelings of gratitude and now she was ready to do everything to fulfill the expectations of the Holy Father. When Helena left the temple, the Holy Father asked Jeffrey what he thought of her. As he looked at her, Jeffrey replied that a girl was a girl and that he could not add anything more. But the Holy Father expressed his interest. He was told that she was an orphan, but he was not satisfied with this information. He wanted to know more about her. The father did not know the exact reason for his interest. Perhaps if he had learned more about her he would have made up his mind. At this time, in the palace, Hugo was talking to Rosaline about the duke's missing theology lessons. The chamberlain thought it was a problem, and Rosaline was rejoicing in her heart. If the chamberlain didn't like it, Helena would definitely be kicked out. The protagonist was unpleasant to watch as she lounged around the palace. Hugo asked in a stern voice why Rosaline just left the situation like that. 
In Rosaline's class diary, there was no indication that any action was taken on her part. Rosaline was in charge of Duke's general education, means she should have helped guide Duke and study theology. The protagonist listened to the reproaches in her direction and did not understand what she was being told off for. Hugo looked at Rosaline unhappily. In that case, he was forced to reprimand her. The protagonist began to worry and make excuses because there were no problems with the other subjects. Her classes the Duke attended with great zeal. The Chamberlain turned away from the girl, asked her to stop because he considered that this was enough. He understood the whole situation and that was where he wanted to end their meeting. Rosaline was angry, she had never been treated so coldly and rudely. Everyone always wanted to be closer to Rosaline. Suddenly the Chamberlain called out to the girl, which made her think that he had come to his senses and would now apologize. But the man asked her not to call him by his name again and that from now on she should not forget their provisions. Rosaline confusedly said that she would be more careful from now on. As soon as the door closed, Rosaline lowered her head from the humiliation she had experienced and began to blame Alina for everything that had happened. The protagonist did not understand how she had come here, being a commoner. Rumors about the absences reached the emperor. They were sitting in the palace drawing room with the Marquis Rainier and Maynard. Rignier grinned, pitying the priestess, he was interested to look at her at least once. Arne shared that he had met Helena once, this interested Rainier, and he asked for more details about their meeting. Maynard bluntly said that he thought she was cute and very small. Rainier compared her to a rabbit, but Arne smiled sweetly and added that the resemblance was true. Maynard smiled naively, remembering their meeting, and muttered that even her hands were very small. The way Maynard showed interest in Helena interested Rainier. He decided to ask what the emperor thought of the priestess. His majesty has been observing the situation so far, but if Levy continues to skip classes, there's nothing left but to find a new teacher. After saying that, the emperor added that he had to go to training, so he would be the first to leave. Rainier was surprised. His majesty never misses a day. He asked if he was tired of doing the same thing every day. His majesty briefly replied that it doesn't matter. It may be boring to some, but the emperor couldn't think of anything else. Alina just returned from the temple received a task from Rosaline. She needed to wash a huge mountain of clothes. From the protagonist's bad mood, Alina assumed that the conversation with the chamberlain had not gone well. But it was odd, because everyone in the novel treated her well. So Alina decided to settle on the idea that Rosaline just decided to take out her anger on her. Alina walked through the woods, looking for a secluded spot. If the palace had seen a middle-class priestess doing her own laundry, they would have thought it strange. Helena came out of the forest path and came upon a man she didn't know standing near a rock. She was looking for a secluded spot and was surprised to see the man away from the palace. The stranger held his sword tightly with his scarred hands. This stranger was the emperor. Because of his thoughts he did not notice Helena at all. Rainier's last words tormented the emperor. Yes, he was always moving forward, not thinking about rest and boredom. Maybe that's why his majesty was able to achieve such results. And in fact, the emperor didn't know what else he could do other than training. The emperor swung his sword and struck the stone hard. He was frustrated at how aimlessly he was spending his time. The sword broke and one of the halves flew behind the emperor's back, followed immediately by a scream that distracted the man from his thoughts. Turning around at the scream, he saw an unfamiliar girl who was almost hit by half of the sword. Alina almost crying apologized for screaming and sarcastically said that she almost died. Alina started telling a man she didn't know that training like that was dangerous, and asked him why he didn't apologize to the man he had just almost killed. No one had ever spoken to the emperor like that before, and he was surprised to be addressed by Alina. The emperor ignored the girl's reproaches and asked who she was. Alina calmly said her name and introduced herself as a middle-class priestess. But the thought flashed through her mind that the man was being too rude to someone he was seeing for the first time. The emperor continued to question Alina about how she had gotten to this place and if she knew where she had come. She did not understand the meaning of these questions and replied that she was just on her way to do laundry and did not know where she was. The emperor said they were in the inner garden. Alina was surprised that she had come so far, for only members of the imperial family lived in this territory. She immediately sank down and spoke all her thoughts out loud. Alina just wanted to find a quiet and secluded place. She began to worry that if the ruthless emperor found out about it, they would be beheaded. But she didn't know that the ruthless emperor was standing in front of her and listening to all this. Alina thought she was at the Dawn Palace, but where she went was a tragedy. When the emperor heard about the Palace of Dawn, he realized where Alina had come from, but decided to find out if she was from there. Alina sadly packing her things, confirmed the emperor's thoughts, adding that she teaches there. 
the emperor had all the facts about the girl and asked directly if she was Duke Levy's teacher, and received an affirmative answer from Alina. The priestess wanted to ask how he knew this, but noticed blood dripping from the emperor's hand. Examining the hands, she noticed a large number of wounds. She also noticed that the stranger was not wearing the uniform of a knight, causing her to assume that he was just an apprentice. Alina grabbed the emperor's hand, much to his surprise. She remembered the promise she had made to his holiness, so she wanted to heal a man who was unfamiliar to her. Smiling sweetly at the emperor, Alina asked him not to worry because everything would be fine. After that she closed her eyes, squeezed the emperor's hand and concentrated on using holy magic. His majesty looked at Alina and the way she used the holy power with surprise. The emperor wondered if she had the same power as his eminence. After a while, Helena plumped down on a rock without strength for some respite. The emperor sat down on the stone beside Alina and said that he had heard about the duke's absences, the theology classes. The priestess sighed and asked if the rumors had reached here. The emperor asked if she knew what the duke was doing at the time. Helena knew of the duke only from rumors that he was back on cakes. She expressed her concern about his diet, though she noted that he was not short of stature. The emperor wondered. It had been a long time since he had seen Levy. He wondered how much he had grown. The emperor was interested in hearing more about Levy. Helena noticed the emperor's pensive face and decided to cheer him up by saying that he shouldn't force himself if something doesn't work out. Even though they were at the bottom of the social pyramid, they should not let their health go to waste. The emperor looked at the priestess in surprise and asked what day she was talking about. Alina with a little laugh told the man not to be embarrassed about his status, after all he was a knight apprentice. She began to explain that only an apprentice could train in such a place, in simple clothes, and hardly any of the real knights would wear such simple clothes. So no matter how you looked at it, to Helena the emperor looked like a knight errant. The emperor tried to say she was wrong, but thinking why she thought so brought him to an abrupt halt. After thinking hard, he realized why the priestess thought he was a disciple. After all, the emperor hadn't told her about his title. He was confused and didn't know what to do about it. Helena kept encouraging him not to get upset and telling him that he would not be an apprentice all his life. The emperor sat in shock and didn't know how to explain. Helena quickly changed the subject and asked how his hand was. All the emperor's thoughts were jumbled. All he could answer was that it was fine. The priestess leaned over and asked if he had anything to say to her. The emperor did not understand what the girl was talking about and asked her directly about it. Alina relaxed and began to tell him what kind of gratitude she expected. The emperor watched Alina and wondered how strange she was. Alina had walked into the emperor's garden on her own and now sat with the emperor and begged words of gratitude. The emperor decided to just turn a blind eye and simply thanked Alina. The priestess began to smile and said that it was nothing. It was not difficult for her and it was good for her too. While saying that, a great idea came to her mind. She approached the uncle and asked if he wanted to make a deal with her. Helena wanted to train her powers and offered to meet with the emperor, once every three days, to treat his wounds from training. It sounded favorable to both, he would be healthy at all times and the priestess would train. The emperor puzzled by the offer, said he didn't get injured that often, so he wasn't sure about the deal. He added and thought that he had potions that were always made for him in case of injury. But the chance to learn something useful made him agree and lie a little to Alina. The emperor made up a legend for Alina that his dream was to become a knight of the Palace of Dawn. And it would be great to guard the entrance to the Palace of Dawn. Because the duke cannot leave it. And the knights are afraid. In the future Duke Levy will be able to choose a new knight and he would like to become this knight. Therefore, in return for training, the emperor asked him to tell him about the duke. Helena did not have to be persuaded for a long time. She immediately extended her hand so that they would seal their bargain in this way. The priestess, as a courtesy, said she would be glad to work with him. After the exchange of handshakes, Alina remembered the mountain of dirty clothes, so she said she had to go. Before leaving, she asked the uncle to tell her name, for she would not call him that all the time. The emperor had two situations replayed in his mind, the first where he calls himself Bakuran and the second where he admits that he is the emperor. In both cases he realized that there would be many problems. There was another option, but the emperor did not remember the last time he was called that. After a little thought he said the name Adre and added that you can just Ray. Alina nodded happily and said goodbye to Ray and ran away. The emperor smiled a little and saw her off with a look. The priestess returned to the palace at dawn and went to her theology class. Waiting in the room, she was not surprised that Duke Levy was not there. But today, not even Nanny Elijah was there. Alina began to ponder what she should do, for she had promised Ray to tell her about Levy. Suddenly a maid ran into the room shouting for the priestess. The maid quickly said that Duke Levy was having a seizure and had to hurry. 
Helena immediately jumped up and with the maid hurried to the duke. Rosaline was near the duke, but could do nothing. She was trembling with fear and did not know what to do. At this time, the two maids, unlike the protagonist, tried to help at least something until help arrived. It all started with Rosaline taking Levy for a walk around the palace, convincing him that he would get better. Even though the duke said he wasn't ready for that, she said it was better to face his fears head on. As it was said in the novel, on the walk, Rosaline and Duke Levy met the emperor. Just seeing the silhouette of his highness, Levy began to have a seizure. He screamed loudly, even though he was unconscious. Ilya all in tears tried to calm the duke, in parallel asking the maids to bring Mrs. Alina. A short time later, Alina was by the duke's side. It was the first time she had seen Levy in such a state. The priestess asked what had happened. Only Rosaline could answer. She tentatively tried to explain that she had simply taken the duke out for a walk with the hope of overcoming his fears. In the novel, it is from this day that things would begin to deteriorate between Rosaline and the duke. The Holy Father was supposed to help with the seizure after a time, but now Helena is in the palace to do so as well. The priestess sat down to Levy and said she would do her best. In her mind she doubted her abilities, for the duke had a mental trauma and such, Alina had never treated before. She put her arm around Levy, touching their foreheads together, closed her eyes and began to concentrate. She wanted to do everything she could to save Levy. After a moment, the duke felt better, his complexion returning to normal, the tension slowly fading away. Levy calmed down and fell into a relaxed sleep. All the maids began to rejoice and thank Helen. Nanny Elijah began to shake the priestess with happiness, without stopping to say words of thanks to her. Helena always felt a little sick right after healing, and the shaking from Nanny got to her. Helena staggered and almost fell over, it startled all the maids again. But Helena stayed conscious and reassured the maids that she was fine, just needed some rest. To distract everyone from herself, Alina asked to move the duke to a quieter place. Elijah supported the priestess and ordered the maids to move the duke to his room. Rosaline stood at the side and when everyone had left began to say that if she had known the duke was in trouble, this wouldn't have happened. That if Mistress Ilya had stopped her or the other maids, it wouldn't have happened. These words of the protagonist infuriated Alina. After all, it looked as if she was putting all the blame on the maids and the nanny. Alina did not keep silent and told Rosaline that she herself took the duke outside, although he refused and said that he was not ready. Rosaline did not expect Helena to answer her, much less to blame her. The priestess did not want to argue long and to soften the conversation, said that to deny her involvement in the seizure of the duke, you cannot. Immediately after her words, Helena hurried back to her room, but she couldn't let Rosaline get away with what she'd done. The protagonist had no time to reply and Helena quietly left. Rosaline only began to mutter that no one understood her and everyone was too impertinent. The emperor had been hiding behind the trees all this time and had seen everything. At Rosaline's last words, he grinned and said sarcastically, who would say anything about impertinence? Calling the servants, the emperor asked them to tell his holiness that he could take his time. He blamed himself for his inattention. Hearing the news that the duke had gone out, the emperor rejoiced and hastened to see for himself. But Levy's trauma was not lost on him. Just by looking at the emperor the duke had a seizure. His highness at the same second ordered the servants around to invite his holiness. Immediately after his words, there were shouts from the servants that Mrs. Helena had arrived. The emperor was grateful that she had cured him. The emperor's heart was still pounding hard. He remembered Levy smiling brightly and calling him brother. The emperor hoped that he would be able to see Levy's smile again someday. After a short time, the duke felt better and woke up. Nanny Elijah was with him the whole time, and when she told him that he had been saved by Mistress Helena and not the Holy Father, Levy was very surprised. The duke thought that the nanny was lying to get him to attend theology classes. The nanny calmly asserted that her words were true and he could see for himself, because thanks to Helen, the duke had no ill effects from the seizure. After a little reflection, he did notice that he felt better than usual after the seizure. Nanny's heart ached at the duke's indifference towards Helen. To take his mind off everything, the duke wanted to go out to eat. Nanny was worried because he had a theology lesson scheduled. Levy said he knew, so they should go. As they passed one of the drawing rooms, Nanny heard children's voices. The duke was curious and went into the room and saw Helena surrounded by children. They were all laughing and the children asked the priestess to tell them another story. No one noticed Duke Levy walking up to them. Because of this, the children and Helena were all surprised and a little scared when Levy asked what story they were talking about. A little unsure, the duke showed interest and said that if it was something interesting, 
he wouldn't mind listening to it either. Alina didn't answer the duke right away. She wondered why he was here. She was just telling the story to the children working in the palace. When Alina saw them peeking from behind the door, she immediately remembered the children she had spent time with in the kindergarten in her past life. The duke got tired of waiting for an answer from the priestess and asked why she was silent. She shuddered and said it was a story from the Holy Scriptures. Looking around Alina noticed that the children around her had just disappeared without her even noticing. The children ran away and hid behind the door. The duke was their master. They didn't want to be scolded if they didn't like the duke. Levy began to resent why his teacher was teaching other children during their class. Alina wanted to say that it was not her fault and the duke himself never came to her. When the book caught her eye, she realized that now was a good chance to get the duke interested in going to theology class. It was also a chance to stay on the job. Helena asked if the duke knew about the stories that had been passed down from generation to generation in Rahan's church, one of which stated, Long ago, a little brother and sister were almost eaten by a wolf. They prayed to the great Rahan for salvation. Impressed by the brother and sister's earnest wish, the great Rahan granted them a rope. After the story, Helena asked what the duke thought about such a moving story. Levy reflected and could not recall such a story in the sacred writings. Helena began to justify that this story is passed down by word of mouth, so there are many stories in Rahana's teachings that are not recorded in books. Levy thought for a while and said that he would come to class if the priestess would tell him such stories. Helena sharply, without thinking answered, yes, of course, but realizing the words of the duke, became nervous and began to mumble. Levy, smirking, said that since Alina was his teacher, she would tell him such stories during class. Alina was surprised that this was not a joke, because the duke always refused to go to class. Levy blushed a little, and said that once he could come to class to the man who had saved him. He added that stories could be interesting. Nanny stood with the children outside the door and cried with happiness, for the duke had finally come to Helen's class. Levy sat down beside the priestess and asked her to continue the story. Alina thought she'd be kicked out soon, but she had a chance to get close to the duke. It's also a chance to keep her promise to Ray. Meanwhile, in the Sun Palace, Rainier and the Emperor were resting in a room after their training. Rainier was grumbling at his cousin because he didn't feel sorry for him at all during the training and he got a good beating. But Rainier himself tried not to lose and in the end it came down to a draw. Because of this, the Emperor praised the cousin because his sword skills got better. Rainier chuckled and said that he always said that after practicing. A servant approached the Marquis and held out a towel. Rainier immediately applied it to his bruised collarbone and faintly changed in his face from the pain. At this time another servant followed him with a tray of healing potions. Rainier, on seeing them, was at once overjoyed and began to praise the potions, which were made by his holiness. The Marquis asked why the Emperor did not drink potions to cure himself. Ray, looking at his hands, remembered the promise made to Helena and answered Rainier that he would do without the potion. The Marquis thought it strange, the Emperor had never refused them before, especially since these potions were made especially for him. Ray replied that he just wanted to make sure of something and it was not important and quickly turned the topic of conversation to the news from the West. Rainier also heard news of the West and they began to share information. Starting with Keynes, taxes had doubled in the other two regions. It looked like they were buying grain from neighboring territories. Oh, and the North, where the main military military forces are located, is all busy now. Rainier told all the information and told his brother that he had nothing to worry about, because he was keeping an eye on everything. The Emperor praised the Marquis for the work he had done and added that this year everything might be delayed. And before he could finish, a Chamberlain knocked on the room with a mountain of papers in his hands. Hugo brought the papers to be dealt with in Duke Levy's class diary. The Emperor asked for the class diary first. He was curious to know something about Levy. Ray asked the Chamberlain what he thought of Levy's teachers. Hugo told him that he had only talked to Baron France's daughter so far. The Emperor asked him to tell at least about her. Hugo told it as it was, that she was intelligent, witty, and had enough ability to teach Duke Levy. The Emperor noted that these qualities were evident even in her handwriting. Reading the diary, he came across Rosaline's description of the Duke's recent seizure and frowned. She had described it as a secret illness that she was treating and the Duke was on the mend. But on that day, the Emperor saw what was happening with his own eyes and would not say that the Duke was on the mend. He thought it was better to treat him more intensely now. Reading this the Emperor remembered how Helena had cured Levy and him. He wanted to talk to the priestess and today he had that opportunity. And he wondered how fearless she would be and whether she would come to the Emperor's territory again. The Emperor was on time to arrive at the very place where they made their promises to each other. Alina was already waiting, re-in place. When she saw the Emperor, she smiled sweetly and greeted him. Alina was glad that Ray was on time. 
To this, the emperor replied that he always keeps his promises. The girl sat down on the grass and said that she liked people she could rely on. Alina patted the ground to get Ray to sit down beside her faster. The emperor grinned, muttered that she was indeed fearless and crouched down beside Alina. The priestess was the first to proceed to fulfill their promise and began the story of the Duke of Levy. She told it straight and as it was. She started from the beginning that she and the Duke were not originally very close. Previously, Alina and the Duke had only met for meals and the girl had used that time to its fullest to learn more about the Duke what he likes from food, what he prefers to do, what books he likes. At first Levy was skeptical of such questioning from a priestess, but the words that she wanted to be friends with him hurt him and made him softer. He was embarrassed and waited in silence until Helene stopped barraging him with questions. When the priestess stopped, the duke hesitantly began to answer the questions and added that if there were more questions he was ready to answer. Satisfied Alina was ready to tell Ray everything she had learned about the duke, she prepared herself for any questions. After a little thought, the emperor asked how Alina saw Duke Levy. The girl made a mock pensive face and said that it was difficult to answer at once. In her thoughts, Alina remembered her first impression of the duke, that he was just a spoiled and selfish boy. But then she began to notice that his behavior was different from what it was in the novel. This was not surprising since the story was written on Rosaline's behalf. After talking to the duke on her own, Helena drew her own conclusions and began to tell her opinion. To her, Levy was a strong child. He lost his parents early, and he can't even meet his only brother. Because of his high status, Levy has no friends at all. He can't even leave the palace because of his illness. But Levy kept smiling every day in spite of everything. Although the Duke is young, but he is very determined and considerate of other people's feelings. Duke is still a child, so he grew and changed every day. Laughing Alina said that apparently the Duke's straightforwardness is hereditary. The emperor was glad to hear something about his brother and unconsciously smiled listening to Alina's story. The girl, seeing Ray's smile, became embarrassed and turned away sharply. She was conquered by the emperor's beautiful smile. Ray decided to ask one more question to find out what is the most important thing for the duke now. After a little thought Alina answered that since he is still a child, nothing special is needed. You just need to believe in him and show your love. The emperor listened to the priestess and noticed how different she was from the baron's daughter, and others. He had never had any of Levy's teachers say such a thing about his brother. There was an awkward silence. Ray didn't ask Helena anything, so she offered to start the treatment and asked what wounds he had received. The emperor showed his hands and said he had hurt himself a bit here. After examining his hands, the priestess was horrified by the large number of wounds and bruises. Helena sighed saying she would do her best, took Ray's hands firmly and began to heal him. After a moment she healed everything, exhaled and said she was tired. The emperor always drank his holiness potions and was surprised at how strong Helena's healing magic was. Ray said that with that kind of power, she could go further and not sit in the middle class priests. Helena flinched at those words from Ray and the mood worsened considerably. People with the power of healing are usually considered middle or upper class. That's why Rahan's blessing is so rare. She didn't know what to say to him. Ray seeing Alina's tense reaction, asked if he had said something wrong. The girl hesitantly replied that it was fine. Because of the promise they had made to each other, they would see each other often now, so it would be difficult for Alina to keep hiding her origins. And she felt that he was a good man, so she didn't want to lie to him. After a moment's thought, Alina asked if Ray was a nobleman. He nodded affirmatively. Gathering her thoughts, Alina began softly, saying that she wanted to be honest with him. So she asked him not to tell anyone what she was about to tell him. The emperor promised he wouldn't tell. Taking a deep breath, Alina looked into Ray's eyes and admitted that she was in fact a commoner. She looked at Ray waiting for a response. Alina was glad she had confessed after all. It was hard for her to lie to everyone around her. But in response to her confession, there was no response. Alina called out to Ray to at least answer something and after a moment he asked if that was the reason she couldn't move up to the upper class. The priestess nodded and explained that the Empire had a very strict status system. The emperor thought about it and said, what if people could advance regardless of their social status? But according to the laws of the current empire, such a thing is impossible. Alina nodded affirmatively and added that commoners had to work all the time to support themselves. If they could be educated, their abilities would start to be valued. Then advancing higher would be possible. Alina began to give real examples. The first were talented swordsmen like Lord Arns working in the fields because they lacked funds. The second were many intelligent people who have to work in the stables. At the end she added that there were many such people. Ray pondered Helena's words and counted her thoughts as entertaining. Yes, and her opinion of Levy the Emperor found unusual. 
Because of this, he decided to increase the number of theology classes. The sun was already setting and it was time for Rei to return. Since the emperor showed no reaction to her status, she was glad and thought he didn't care about it. Before leaving, the emperor turned around and said that they would meet again in three days at the same time. Alina was glad to talk to Rei, though not for long, she felt more cheerful. One day, Alina and Levi were having a lesson in the garden. When the servants saw them, they immediately started whispering about them. Everyone noticed how much time they began to spend together. The servants thought it was because the priestess had saved the duke and so he liked her. During this time, the duke teased the priestess about not giving her the letter. The story of the letter began when Helena opened an envelope for upper-class persons that someone had thrown away in the parlor. Inside the letter was an invitation to a banquet at the imperial palace, and Helena wanted to go, and persuaded the duke to let her go to the banquet, for she, too, needs to rest sometimes. Levy puffed up his cheeks and asked if her words meant that she was bored with him and in general who asked for more theology classes. That was another reason she wanted to go to the banquet. The duke kept resisting and saying that if she had time to go to places like that, she should tell him more stories, and he did not understand why a priestess should go to a banquet. Helena quietly replied that priests were people too, but her real reason was Rainier's presence at the banquet. The plot of the novel described this banquet and the Marquis and she wanted to see it all live. The Duke decided to give in a little to the teacher and asked what she could give him in return. Helena crossed her arms pouted her lips and asked what he wanted then. Levy smirked and asked for five tickets to extend the class. Alina began to haggle and offered at least two. Levy was against it. He called her unscrupulous and asked for three at least and if they didn't agree, he would burn the envelope. Helena had nothing left and agreed to three tickets and grabbed the envelope and quickly hid it. The duke said he would use one ticket now. The priestess began to resent him, for she had already told one story. Levy responded to the teacher's indignation and asked her to return the envelope if she didn't like something. Helena coughed a little and said that she just had a bit of a sore throat. After thinking for a bit, Duke decided to take a break for an hour. The priestess kept wondering why the duke decided to take a break. But when all the children of the castle workers gathered in the garden, she realized everything. Alina smiled and thought that apparently the duke wanted to spend time with the other children in this way. Alina started to tell the backstory and all the kids started to marvel and say something. Levy started to grumble and threaten the children that if they kept making noise, they wouldn't hear the story. And ordered Alina to be more serious and not to stop during the story. Alina laughed a little and began to tell the story. All this time Rainier was watching them. He had specifically asked the servants not to tell the duke of his coming and hiding behind the trees watched. To the Marquis the whole spectacle was amusing. It was the first time he had seen the troubled child Levy listening so obediently to someone. Rainier wondered who this priestess was who was able to enlighten the duke. Watching them, he was convinced by Maynard's words that she was quite sweet. Rainier was interested in Helena and wanted to see something else interesting. The day of the banquet at the Imperial Palace came. Alina went to it as she wanted and couldn't believe her eyes. In the novel this event was described very beautifully, but she did not think that in reality it would be even better. Looking around Alina noticed that everyone came in pairs and she was alone. But it didn't bother her, she wanted to spend time with the delicious cake that stood out from all the appetizers. Alina heard a man's voice behind her call out to Miss Francisco, praising Rosalind's appearance. The protagonist smiled sweetly and flirted with the man. The priestess looked at Rosaline and became furious. She remembered how, before the banquet, the protagonist had made her rewash all her dresses. Alina had washed them in the river until her hands were numb. Alina didn't want to think about washing at such a beautiful banquet, so she turned away from Rosaline and continued eating the cake. Unexpectedly, a man's voice came from behind and startled her by asking her if she liked the cake. The girl choked with surprise and started coughing. Turning around she saw Maynard. He smiled sweetly and greeted Alina and said that he didn't expect to see her at the banquet. Alina just started to ask why he was here, as Arns sharply replied that he was an aristocrat too, after all. The priestess looked at him and couldn't take her eyes off him. He had been dressed like a knight the first time they met, but now he smelled of wealth. Maynard said upset that they hadn't seen each other since that day in the library. Helena awkwardly looked away and replied that she had been very busy lately. Arns marveled at the teacher's busyness and began to praise her for her kindness and helping her colleague. Helena grinned at how easy it was to surprise Maynard. He was the same way in the novel. His unrequited love, Rosaline. He hid his own feelings to keep her out of the way. Helena reading the novel sympathized with Arns. The priestess cut off another piece of cake and handed it to Arns, saying that he liked desserts. He asked in surprise how she knew that. 
Because of Maynard's simplicity, she spoke up and said that she had read The Empress of. Realizing that she had started to speak, she stopped abruptly and said nervously that she could see everything in her eyes. Maynard asked sadly if it was true that his face showed that he liked sweets. Laughing, Helena justified that the atmosphere around him is like a cream cake. And who doesn't like cakes? The girl also added and handed over a plate with a cake. Arns a little upset thanked the priestess for the cake. Helena ate the cake, happy that she was not alone. The cake was delicious, and she looked at Maynard and asked him how he liked it. Arns nodded affirmatively and asked if Duke Levy was at the banquet. Alina did not take her eyes off the food and told him that only she and Baron Francisco's daughter had come from the palace dawn. Maynard said briefly, understandably, and continued eating the cake. Alina was surprised that Arns had not raised an eyebrow when he heard about Rosaline, but she thought they were not close enough yet, and perhaps he would have feelings for her later, to keep the conversation going. Maynard made up topics of conversation and said that the banquet would be longer than usual because of his majesty's absence. Helena inquired why this was so. It's because everyone would be upset if they didn't see such a noble here. It's not the same atmosphere without him. No one would be satisfied with the banquet if he didn't come, Maynard told Alina. One of the reasons Alina wanted to attend the banquet was because of Rainier's presence. She started to look around when Arns noticed this. He inquired if she was waiting for someone. Alina continued to look around and replied that she was just looking around. Maynard thought that maybe Alina was bored with him, but he didn't have time to do anything about it. A servant came up to him and told him that the Count was expecting him. Maynard asked Helen if she would mind if he went away for a while. The priestess could answer nothing but that she did not mind and would wait for him. Arns bowed and said goodbye that he would be back soon. Alina smiled and nodded back. As soon as Maynard left, she decided to walk down the hall to find Rainier. Suddenly there was a scream in the hall. Alina immediately looked up and went to the sounds. She had expected something like this because of the affair. At that banquet, when a strange girl on Rosaline's dress, she screamed loudly and Rainier came to her aid. And so their first meeting took place. The Marquis held the girl's hand gently, asking her how she felt and if she was hurt. Helena and the other girls stood aside and admired Rainier's beauty. All the girls were crazy about Rainier, for he was a dazzling blonde who had inherited the Emperor's blood. His blue eyes were like gems. Every girl in the Empire couldn't take her eyes off him. Helena looked at Rainier and could not believe her eyes that such a dazzling handsome man existed. She wondered how handsome the Emperor must be if Rosaline had not chosen the Marquis. For a few seconds, Helena and Rainier crossed eyes, but it was so brief she couldn't believe it had actually happened. Helena was distracted from her thoughts by Maynard, who had already returned to her. She was surprised that she had finished her business so quickly. Arns, she said, had just greeted her father, so it hadn't taken long. Maynard gently leaned over to Helena a little and asked if she had spoken to anyone in his absence. The priestess calmly replied that she knew no one here, so there was no one to talk to. Maynard clutched his clothes tightly with his hands, he was visibly nervous, but he was talking about fireworks. In a trembling voice he began to ask if Helena would mind. But before he could finish they were interrupted by the Marquis Rainier. He crept up behind the girl and said in her ear, I beg your pardon. This frightened Helena, she screamed, stumbled over her dress and began to fall. The Marquis managed to catch her and smiling charmingly asked her to be careful, looking shrilly at Helena. He noted that she was not often in such places and asked if she was, calling her a priestess. Maynard's face changed dramatically. He hadn't expected to see the Marquis at this banquet because he hadn't originally planned to come. Arns approached Helena and politely told her that his actions were disrespectful to his mistress. Afterward, he inquired how Helena was feeling. She briefly replied that she was fine. Afterward, Rainier asked Arns to take a look at the balcony. That's where the Earl of Winterhill was sitting. He had come to the capital because of the problems with the army in the north, so the Marquis couldn't leave a banquet in the imperial palace for a stream of aristocracy. The Count had lived in reclusiveness for almost twenty years and here he suddenly came to the banquet. Rainier wondered what he was up to. Helena could never hide or control her face when she looked at someone with admiration. She looked at him like a true fan who had seen her idol in person. Maynard remembered that Helena and Rainier were not officially acquainted and had just begun to introduce her when the Marquis interrupted him told that she was the Duke of Levy's theology teacher, Mistress Helena. Helena and Rainier exchanged pleasantries upon their first meeting, after which she asked how he knew she was a theology teacher. The Marquis smirked and replied that he had previously chatted with a colleague of hers and thanks to her, he knew she was a theology teacher. This explained why, during his conversation with Rosalind, he looked at Helena for a moment. That question was resolved for her, but a new one appeared, why the first conversation between the protagonist and the hero was about her. 
Rainier went to the point of flattery and began to gush that everyone was only talking about her because of the selfish duke opening up to her. These rumors also interested the Marquis, so he wanted to meet her, Rainier justified himself. Alina felt a little embarrassed by the rumors. She smiled sweetly and replied that it was just her job and she liked it. She smiled sweetly and replied that it was just her job and she liked it. Rainier's mind flashed back to her lesson in the garden with Levy, and he mentally commented that she not only loved her job, but that she was responsible for it. Rainier gently took the girl's hand and continued to flatter her and to speak words of sympathy for her hard work. Then he kissed Helena's hand in the hope that her heart would yield to it. Lifting his head, the Marquis expected to see Helena blush, shriek in surprise, and then fall in love with him. But looking at her, Rainier saw no reaction and it shocked him. No girl had ever been able to resist that trick before and he didn't understand why Alina had acted that way. At this time all the other girls who saw it whispered and envied Alina. The priestess's reaction was so dry because she didn't realize what had really happened to her. Alina was overjoyed to experience the very scene from the novel with Rosaline and could not react properly. She felt like she was at a fan meeting. Maynard sensed the awkwardness of the situation and decided to intervene, asking Alina how she was feeling and if she wanted to go somewhere quieter. Alina replied that she was fine, she was just a little hungry, as she had never had a proper cake. Alina offered Arns to keep her company at dessert. Unexpectedly, Rainier asked if he could go with them. The priestess turned and looked at the Marquis in surprise. He smirked and said that he did not insist and would be happy to join them, if she did not mind. On the day of the banquet Helena was comparing everything with the plot of the novel, and she did not remember that Rainier had eaten cake during the banquet. According to the plot the Marquis should have liked Rosaline by now, and at the banquet he should have been with her. So Helena wondered why Maynard and Rainier were walking around her. She didn't understand why what was happening in the novel was different. Helena bluntly asked if the men had anything to do, maybe an appointment or someone waiting for them. Rainier was surprised at such questions and asked the priestess if she wanted him to leave. She hesitantly mumbled a few times, no, no, no one added that such important people just have a lot of things to do. The Marquis replied with a smile that he was completely free. Helena began to insist that Rainier should think hard and perhaps he had simply forgotten something. Marquis looks at the girl in shock and does not understand why she asked him such questions, why she took him for a womanizer. Rainier looks at Alina's face and wonders why there is no interest in him at all in her eyes. The Marquis was not going to back down, so he assured Helena that his eyes were now fixed only on her. The priestess said nothing to this, turned away from him, put a piece of cake on a plate, and held it out to Rainier with the words, Here is the cake you wanted. Taking the cake Rainier said that the cake in her hands looked much more appetizing. Alina didn't say anything to that. She wondered if she was getting too excited about the change in the plot. Rainier, as he said did not back down and in response to the girl's silence complimented her looks. Alina was not too embarrassed and politely thanked him for the compliment. She still did not understand the intentions of the Marquis, because she just chucked a talk to him and gave a piece of cake. Helena became curious about the Earl of Winterhill he had mentioned earlier. Rainier began to talk about the Count with pleasure. His family rules the largest territory in the north. Prior to his predecessor, he held the position of chairman of the aristocratic association. But because of one scandal, the current head had to return to his territories. It is said that during this time, things in the imperial palace began to improve, as well as the lives of the locals. Having said that, Rainier paused, but of course that was not all. Winterhill has a strong military power, which was closely watched by the imperial palace. This family could rebel at any time. The Marquis didn't know why he had come to the banquet, but now he at least understood the excitement of the aristocrats. One of the servants went to the center of the hall, began to speak loudly to attract attention and said that very soon the performance with fireworks will begin. And if ladies and gentlemen wanted to watch the carried family magicians, they should go to the balcony or to the garden. Helena was glad at once, for this was the main event of the banquet, and Rainier and Maynard were to watch it with Rosaline, so the girl decided to leave it at that, so as not to interfere with the original plot. But suddenly, Rainier and Maynard called out to Alina in a single voice, inviting her to watch the fireworks. The men looked at each other, they didn't expect this from each other, just as Alina didn't understand what was happening to them. She abruptly apologized and said they should go to the fireworks with Miss Francis. Maynard asked who it was and Rainier why he should call her. The atmosphere was getting a little heated. Helena was tired of looking for a reason for their behavior. During the banquet, they should not have circled around her, but been near Rosaline. Helena was afraid that she had changed the plot of the story. Helena got a massive headache from it. The plate fell out of her hands, thus scaring Rainier and Maynard. 
They freaked out and started calling for a doctor. Alina fainted and blamed herself for ruining the banquet. After the banquet, when Alina recovered, the meeting with Rosaline was unavoidable. She began to reprimand the priestess for being too willful lately. The protagonist couldn't believe that Alina had time for love games. Alina didn't understand what that was about. So Rosaline had to explain to her that there were rumors about her sweet talk at the banquet with Lord Ains and Marquis Werner. That afternoon Rosaline had stumbled on purpose to attract his attention. Alina began to reassure Rosaline by saying that nothing had happened between them. The protagonist smirked and said that she had an assignment for Alina that would be waiting in her room. Back in her room, a huge new batch of dirty clothes was waiting for Alina. She dealt with it quickly, but she didn't realize how Rosaline had gotten so many dirty clothes. Alina wanted to find the protagonist's weak spot so she wouldn't have to run errands for her anymore. Alina has to go to the library and clean Rosaline's room. Because of her duties, she doesn't have enough time to sleep and rest. Alina was worried that the more she interfered with the plot, the worse it got. The priestess entered Rosaline's room and placed the laundry basket on the floor. The main character smirked and said that Alina had not cleaned her room well, but she had cleaned everything perfectly and didn't want to reclean her huge room. Rosaline began to blackmail the girl, saying that she would tell the emperor that she was a commoner. Alina had nothing else to do, so she wanted to at least mitigate the punishment and asked in what places to clean. But Rosaline did not succeed in smiling. She pointed to the whole room. Alina sighed and said she would go and get what she needed and come back. In her mind, she couldn't calm down from this injustice. She was tired of it, both mentally and physically. In the novel, Rosaline was very busy. Not only was she teaching classes, but she was also spinning a romance with the three characters. Alina got the idea to use her affair to her advantage. She calmed down and decided that this was just the beginning, so things would work out and all three heroes would fall in love with her. And to make things happen faster, Alina decided to help Rosaline with her love affairs. She knew all the romantic stories connected with the plot, so she was confident in her abilities. Alina wanted to do whatever it took to get her peaceful days back. Later that evening, Alina hurried to meet Ray. They arrived at the meeting place at the same time, and the Emperor's appearance showed that he had just finished his training. Alina quickly asked for a quicker hand for healing. Ray, watching her, only now noticed that she really looked like a rabbit. The priestess gently took hold of Ray's hands. The emperor wondered if Helena had to hold hands during the treatment and asked her about it, leaning slightly towards her. Helen was surprised at this question and a little confused, replied that it was part of the process, and asked a question in return. She wondered why he asked her that and if Ray didn't like to be touched by women other than her lover. The emperor answered that she did not. And before he could say anything, Alina let him know that she was done with the treatment. Alina always felt sick after using healing magic, but today her voice hurt much more because of Rosaline's orders. The Emperor noticed the girl's pale face, approached her and asked her how she was feeling. Alina was embarrassed by the fact that Ray was very close to her face, but despite her embarrassment she replied that she was fine. Alina felt like Ray would drill a hole in her if he kept looking at her. But after a few seconds he pulled back and said that her eyes had changed color after she'd used her powers. The priestess was surprised, she had never noticed this before. The empress sat down on the ground and began to think aloud about Alina's powers. Every time after she treated him, he felt a change in his body. Because of that, Ray wondered if she had any other powers. Alina asked in surprise what he meant. But the emperor didn't really understand it himself. He just felt as if her power was mixing with his mana and then accumulating in his body. In order for this to happen, they must be equal, so it had never happened to the Emperor before. Because of the presence of her mana in him, Ray felt strange, but he couldn't say it was bad. The Emperor once again asked her how she felt, because according to her stories, she had been using magic for him a lot lately. Alina smiled and replied that she was fine. The priestess unconsciously put her hand on Ray's shoulder and said that if he was worried about anything, she would be glad to help him. It was the first time the Emperor had been spoken to so freely, it was strange to him. After that Alina gently asked if Ray knew Lord Arns. The Emperor, either from the surprise of the question, or because of his role, asked who she meant. The girl calmly began to describe Maynard as a tall, dark-haired knight, close to the Emperor. Alina realized from Ray's confused face that he didn't know who he was talking about and wondered how he could not know such a famous knight. The Emperor asked why she was asking him about arms. Alina said it was a long story and she only needed to know one thing. Ray answered curtly that he could ask the other knights. The girl exclaimed happily and thanked Ray in advance. After their little pact, Ray wanted to know what exactly he was going to find out about Lord Arns. Alina, smiling slyly, said that she wondered what kind of girls Arns liked. 
The next day, there was a thunderstorm and a downpour, which made the atmosphere in the palace eerie. At this time, Maynard followed the corridor to the emperor's study. Arns greeted the emperor and asked what he had been summoned to do. The emperor asked Maynard what kind of girls he liked and asked him to describe his ideal type. Maynard stared at the emperor in a stupor and did not understand why he was asking such questions. His majesty urged Arns on and he replied sharply in a stupor that he liked girls who were good at cooking. The emperor asked for more information. After a little thought Arns continued that he likes girls who are well-read and have a lot of common topics to talk about. Worried about the emperor, he stopped and asked how he was feeling. Unexpectedly for Maynard, the emperor showed his emotions for the first time and they were negative. His majesty looked menacingly at Arns and said that he was fine. Even the butler, who was pouring tea in the room at the time, was surprised by this unusual behavior. The emperor finally asked what time Arns usually went to his favorite confectionery, and when he heard the answer, he let him go. It had been a couple of days, and Ray had told her everything he'd learned about Maynard. Alina pondered how the information she'd learned from Ray on the way to the library might be useful. She was disappointed that Maynard hadn't been to his favorite pastry shop much lately. Alina wondered how Rosaline and Arns could meet, if not at the pastry shop. While she pondered, the carriage pulled up at the library. At the entrance to the library, she ran into Maynard. Upon seeing the priestess, the lord smiled. They exchanged pleasantries and Helena wanted to give the book away before the library closed and returned to the palace to rest. Maynard grabbed Alina's hand a little confused. The priestess calmly asked what was wrong. Arns blushed with embarrassment, squeezed Alina's hand harder and asked if she could give him some free time. Alina, not understanding Maynard's true intentions, asked why he wanted to detain her. Arns was frightened by the girl's reaction, for he had expected the opposite. Maynard apologized for his behavior if it frightened or inconvenienced Miss Alina. Helena didn't want to go back to the palace because Rosaline would throw more work at her. Because of this, she wondered if she should agree to spend time with Maynard. The thought of what tasks Rosaline might give her frightened the priestess, so she thought about it for a while. Alina said she would take the book to the library and go with Lord Arns. Maynard, overjoyed, offered to help and carry the book himself. Alina had no time to reply, but Arns grabbed the book and ran to the library. Seeing Arns' joyful face, Alina wondered where he would take her and for some reason she began to worry. Maynard quickly returned from the library and they headed into town. Maynard brought Alina to his favorite pastry shop. The girl looked around with delight, but her positive feelings were quickly replaced by excitement. She did not understand why he had brought her to the confectionery where he should be with Rosaline, and did he not visit it less often. Arns turned pale and his face changed dramatically when he saw Alina's confused face. He said sadly, it must be strange for a knight to come to such places. Alina was embarrassed by his reaction, for she knew that Maynard was ashamed of his love for sweets. So she began to explain her reaction by saying that she had never been to such places, so she was surprised and convinced him that it doesn't make any difference to whom and what suits, as long as the person likes it. Moreover, many people like sweets, Alina added cheerfully. Looking sweetly at Arns, the priestess said how nice it was that their tastes coincided. Maynard was pleased by these words and thanked her for the different view of the situation. Helena looked back at the desserts for a second and noticed that there were literally a couple of bites left. She exclaimed, which startled Maynard and he asked what was wrong, and Alina sharply replied that there were hardly any cakes left. She grabbed him by the arm and dragged him to the counter. Because of her loud voice and the way she grabbed and dragged Maynard, all the ladies in the cafe were watching them. Arns felt uncomfortable with all the stares and whispered to Alina that everyone was watching them. Alina, not the least bit embarrassed, quickly let go of his hand, apologized for her impatience and suggested that they hurry to get the desserts before they were all taken away. Maynard was distracted for a moment, pleased to feel Alina's warmth in his arms. Alina and Maynard took a couple of desserts and sat down at the table. The girl's eyes were scattered, she didn't know where to start. She sighed and giggled, saying that she understood why they were being taken away so quickly. Arns watched the priestess and laughed. Alina asked why he was laughing. Maynard complimented her, saying how cute she was. The girl thought he was encouraging her to take the strawberries off the cake. So she pushed the cake away and said she wasn't buying the flattery and wouldn't give him the strawberries. That made Maynard laugh even more and offered her a taste of the chocolate cake. Alina looked at the cake with devouring eyes and asked if she looked that greedy. Arns shook his head negatively and replied that the chocolate cakes here were delicious. Alina resisted a little and gladly took the chocolate cake. Alina was having a good time, with delicious desserts and pleasant conversation. When all the desserts were eaten and the conversation was coming to an end, Alina began to thank Maynard for the evening. 
She confessed that she had been feeling down lately. Arns was glad to hear that and asked if she was feeling any better. Alina glowed with happiness and answered that she felt much better. Alina's smile made Maynard's heart beat harder. He felt again the pleasant atmosphere that he had remembered from the girl he wanted to see the most. While Maynard was in the clouds, Helena admired his pretty face and complimented him. Arns thanked her for her kind words. But it wasn't flattery at all. Everyone thought he was quite nice, Alina said. She went on telling Arns how delightful he was and that she was not the only one who thought so. And at one point she almost called him by his name by accident. She had forgotten from excitement and almost called him in her usual way. Arns had a very surprised look on his face, and unexpectedly for Alina, he asked her for a favor. His surprised face changed to a confused one and he timidly asked to be called by his name. They're not that close, so Alina was surprised by the request. So she thought it was a suggestion to become friends. After thinking it over, Alina called him Lord Maynard without hesitation. Maynard's heart fluttered harder than before. He bent slightly hiding his face and handed Alina his remaining piece of cake. The priestess didn't resist for long and took the last piece of cake with an innocent face. Helena thanked him again and called him by name again. At that moment Maynard thanked the girl in return and gave her his heart and all his love. After a while, one day Alina was given a gift, a shawl. She tried it on with Ilya and the duke. The nurse praised the priestess's appearance and was pleased that the shawl fit her perfectly, as if it had been made for her. Alina was a little embarrassed to ask if she could really accept such a valuable item. Ilya smiled sweetly and asked to keep the shawl. After all, it had been picked up specifically for Alina to give as a gift for her labor to the duke. The priestess was embarrassed to accept the shawl, but she thanked the duke and Ilya with embarrassment. It was the first time in this world that Alina was having such a good time. When she first came here, she never thought she would become so attached to this place. The nanny continued to compliment Alina, telling her that she looked better. She tried to politely deny it, but Ilya was unstoppable, adding that she wasn't the only one who thought so and that all the servants were saying so. At that moment Levy looked at the nanny in surprise. The duke puffed up his cheeks and said that such an unassuming and lowly saint could not interest the others. Alina started teasing and said that he was a giant, according to him. Levy smirked and replied that he was taller than the other eight-year-olds. After arguing a little with Alina, he turned to the servants and looked menacingly in their direction, as if to say that he would not give his teacher to anyone. Alina did not understand why the duke did not like her small popularity so much. Levy also did not forget about the nanny and asked her not to flatter Helena so that she would not suddenly believe her words. Ilya tried to change her master's mind, but it was useless. When the moment came the maid came and informed the duke that he had a visitor. Usually no one visited Levy, so Helena and the duke himself were surprised at the news. When he asked who his visitor was, the maid said the Marquis Rainier von Werner. Alina was delighted. According to the plot of the novel it was the same day, when Rainier came to visit Rosaline in the Palace of Dawn after the banquet. They hadn't been able to spend time together then, but today was a good chance to bring them closer together. Rainier was waiting for the Duke in the garden. Helena was worried about Levy because he had only left the palace once and he had only seen the Imperial Palace from afar. So she decided to go with them in case of a seizure. The Marquis met the Duke and first asked how he was doing. Levy ignored the question and said that his clothes were still as shiny as ever. Rainier laughed because his brother had not changed a bit. The Marquis freely began to rub Levy's hair, saying at the same time that he had hardly grown. The Duke proudly replied that he would grow up. After a little chat with his brother, the Marquis turned his attention to Helena. Rainier kissed the priestess's hand and began to pity her, saying how sad he was without her and without her reply to the letters he had sent. Helena was uncomfortable with such a greeting and gently asked for her hand to be released. Helena had not received any letters, so she was surprised to ask what letters Rainier was talking about. The Marquis thought it strange, for he had sent three letters, and not one for a long time. Looking at Levy, the Marquis wondered if someone might have taken them. The Duke, noticing the look on his face, blushed and began to resent him for looking at him and asking such a question. Rainier smiled slyly and said that it would be a pity if the letters disappeared like that because one of them contained a check for a tidy sum. Levy shouted sharply that the Marquis was lying and there was nothing in the letters. Rainier was not surprised and laughed. Helena looked at the Duke and asked why he had done so. The Duke began to stammer and did not know what to say. The Marquis laughingly answered that everything is clear, because he always has such a beautiful girl with him. The Duke plucked up courage and shouted again, denying the Marquis words and saying that it was all for Helena's sake. He continued shouting and explaining that Rainier was a womanizer. Grabbing Helena firmly by the hem of her dress, 
he asked her not to fall for Rainier's face and sweet speeches. The Marquis did not want to deceive Helena, so he did not deny Levy's words, but added that the past could not be changed, but he could change himself. Rainier went into the inside pocket of his jacket. Levy reacted sharply and asked him not to pester Helena anymore. Rainier grinned and asked since when he could decide for Helena. After all, she's just his theology teacher. Levy threw a tantrum and shouted that Helena was not just a teacher, she was like a big sister to him. Helena rushed to comfort Levy, stroking his head and telling him not to cry. Rainier looked at the Duke in surprise. He had never opened up to anyone as he had to her. The Marquis did not understand what it was that Helena had the ability to attract people to her. After all, he also laid his eyes on her. When Levy had calmed down, the Marquis apologized for going too far. Taking a letter from his jacket, he handed it to the Duke and said that it was for him, not for Mrs. Helena. The letter was an invitation from His Majesty to a meeting. Levy looked at the letter and did not know what to say to his brother. After some thought, the Duke decided to return to the room, saying he had to go. No one was surprised by Levy's decision. It was his usual behavior. When the opportunity arose, Helena decided to ask Rainier a question. She wondered why Levy did not have a seizure at the sight of the Marquis and was quite calm. Rigmier was pleasantly surprised that she noticed this and did not hide anything and told her. The last meeting between the Marquis and Levy was five years ago, when he immediately fainted. After that, His Majesty immediately returned to the Empire. At that time, the palace was in chaos, so the Emperor had no time for his younger brother. So the Marquis Rainier took on the role of elder brother, despite his busy schedule. As a result, he cried less and became closer to Rainier. It was not easy to bring about any improvement in his condition. After telling the Marquis, Helena concluded that he valued his brother very much, although Rainier simply considered it his duty. But the Marquis was relieved that Levy had become attached to Helena. Rainier asked Helena to calm the Duke, as he was going through a difficult time. She thought it was a request not only to reassure him, but also to persuade him to meet with the Emperor. Rainier had no hope that Levy would accept Levy's invitation. He never did. And the thought that the criminal who had targeted Levy was still at large worried everyone. The Marquis had a plan to arrange a meeting between the Duke and the Emperor. Levy was calm around him, so he was willing to go there together and be always by his side so that he wouldn't have a seizure. In the novel, Rainier did not do anything for nothing, so Helena asked suspiciously what he wanted in return. The Marquis laughed, pleased that the girl understood him so well. Smiling he began to pour over a huge amount of information without stopping. He asked for permission to accompany her to lunch in a few days. Helena had only to send a note and cancel her already scheduled lunch with Duke Lloyd. Rainier had one wish and he wanted her to listen to one request. He assured her that the request would not burden her or take up much of her time. The Marquis held out his hand to Helena and said he would accept any answer she gave. Helena didn't trust him much, but it was a great chance to help Levy, so she shook his hand, accepting his offer. After that day, everything went well. Duke Levy decided to accept the Emperor's invitation at the suggestion of Marquis Werner. Everyone in the palace donned expectant and tense. The Emperor was also dressed up. Ray's tension was also noticed by Helena during their meeting. The Emperor was upset that she had figured him out so quickly. He honestly confessed that he would soon meet his younger brother, with whom he hadn't spoken for a long time. Helena was surprised at such a coincidence and told that the Emperor would soon meet his brother. The priestess asked how long it had been since Ray had seen his brother. Ray couldn't remember the last time they had seen each other, so he simply replied that it had been a long time. Alina didn't understand why he was worried and not happy, so she asked Ray. The emperor thought the girl's words were right, but he still did not understand what he should talk about with his brother, whom he had not seen so much. On the sixth birthday of the duke, Ray brought him a present without warning him about his visit. Then Levy had another seizure, which made him not think he would accept his invitation. Ray did not answer Alina for a long time and she was worried. But soon he was distracted from his thoughts and continued to communicate. To help Ray, Alina asked how old his brother was, and when she heard the answer, his age matched the Duke's. But it didn't seem strange to Alina. The priestess, considering his age, suggested that Ray ask his brother what he liked or maybe who he liked. The emperor thought that the question of who his brother liked was too mature. But to this Alina only laughed and said that he did not understand anything about children because they were now growing up fast and it would not be superfluous to ask it. Seeing how tense Ray was, she advised him to relax. Even though she didn't know all the circumstances, she wanted the meeting to go well. Out of interest, Ray asked about Alina's relationship with her family. Alina said with a smile on her face that she had been left at the temple as a child. Usually, when children are dropped off, they leave their clothes and other things behind. 
But in Alina's case it was different, she was an unwanted child. The emperor was not very surprised by the priestess' story. At the end he only asked her if she hated her parents. Helen smilingly replied, no, but she thought that trees with trunks grow straight and strong. And even after that, she added that as much as he loved his brother, he wanted to meet him. So Alina thought that Ray should be a good support for his brother, so that everything would work out. The words of the priestess struck and helped the emperor. Ray put his hand on the girl's head and started stroking it thanking her for her support. The moment Ray's smile grew warmer, her heart gave a thumping sound that was strange to her. Alina had no idea dot what those feelings were. The day of the duke's meeting with the emperor came. Levy stood in his room and looked at himself in the mirror. Helena was by his side, and seeing his excitement, she asked how he was feeling. Levy shared with Alina that he was worried whether their meeting with his brother would go well. He was worried that he would embarrass himself again and that his brother would not feel sorry for him at all afterwards. But most of all, he didn't want to hurt his brother again with his seizure. Helena was worried about Levy. She thought about how to help him be braver. Suddenly she remembered her pendant. She asked him to come closer and put her pendant on him. Alina still didn't know why she treasured that pendant, but today she knew that it was more important than Levy. She put it on him and told him that it would help him if he was in a difficult situation, because it had her healing magic in it. At the end before the meeting, Alina took the duke by the shoulders and told him that even though he had the courage to come to the meeting now, there was no shame in wanting to come back at some point. She wanted Levy to realize that no matter what happened, his majesty would always cherish him. Unexpectedly for Alina, the duke asked to be called Levy. Seeing how embarrassed he was by this request, the priestess promptly agreed to his request. Whereupon, Levy in good spirits followed with his nanny to the meeting. Alina saw him off with a glance, and for some reason she had a good feeling about the meeting, especially since Rainier should be there, so Alina was not expecting any problems. At this time in the imperial palace everything was ready. The emperor stood at the door and gathered his thoughts, hoping that everything would go well. Remembering Helen's words to get closer to his brother he was determined to make the first step. The emperor entered the room where the marquis, the duke and his nanny were waiting for him. They exchanged greetings and immediately after Ray met Levy, nothing happened. This pleased the emperor very much. In order not to put pressure on his brother from the first minutes, the emperor said how pleased he was to meet again, turned away and suggested that they follow to the table. All the dishes at the table were Levy's favorites, but he didn't care about that, he was fighting the dizziness that overcame him. The emperor saw that the duke had not begun to eat and calmed him by saying that he could relax and eat slowly. Levy was relieved by his brother's smile. At that moment Rainier joined the conversation. He was wondering what kind of pendant with a female design Levy was constantly rubbing in his hands. Levy abruptly hid it in his hands and said that he had gotten it from Helena. No one knew the Emperor and Helena knew each other, so when the Duke mentioned her, Rainier looked at Ray and explained that she was his theology teacher. The Emperor briefly replied that he had heard of her from Hugo. Rainier switched back to Levy immediately after his answer, asking how close he and Helena were. Because from the outside, an unknowing person could easily think they were brother and sister. Levy, though worried, defended his teacher and said that she was not like the other priests. Rainier watched Levy's embarrassment and laughed at him. The Marquis confirmed that he found her interesting and suggested that the Emperor meet her too. Rainier began to describe her as weak in appearance, but brave and strong inside. He even added that she was not embarrassed by his looks and that it hurt his pride a little. Levy picked up his brother and added that she just didn't judge people by their looks. Levy considered Helena a person with a big heart, and she always listened attentively to his stories. The Emperor and Rainier listened attentively to his brother, and when he had finished there was an awkward silence, which embarrassed the Duke a little. Following Helena's advice, the Emperor asked Levy if he liked her. This question made the Duke blush with embarrassment, fidgeting in his chair, and confusing his words. He could not give a precise answer. Rainier could not let such a moment pass and began to tease Levy again. He asked him if he liked her enough to marry her. Levy, not understanding, replied that in ten years he would be an adult. This made the Marquis laugh very much and pleased the Emperor. For the first time in a long time the Emperor spent time with his brother. He watched him happily, for the meeting was going well and calmly. Ray mentally thanked Helena for helping Levy and him. If you don't want to miss my new videos, support the channel by subscribing and don't forget to like the video.